thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Greg Miller, Chair of Civil Environmental Engineering, and it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the, the third speaker, Matt Preeti, for tonight's talk. Um, as somebody who grew up in Seattle, one of my earliest memories was driving across, well, sitting in the back seat, <laughs> driving across the Alaskan Way Viaduct, and, and they always had the brightly colored octopus on Ivers. And so looking out over the blue water, uh, I, I, I have sort of in my past history a bit of an affinity for the viaduct. As I've gotten older and as I've learned more about structures and structural behavior, I don't spend a lot of time on the viaduct. And it's now, uh, it's actually a very interesting project. When we talk to our students, we talk about civil environmental engineering as the kind of thing that involves politics, society, economics, all kinds of things. And I think this, this tunnel project has all those aspects in spades. Years and years and years of debate on the, on the political, social side. Um, and then finally, when the decisions are made, the engineering challenges come, and the engineering challenges are formidable. I think it's easy, for, again, from a, from a layman's perspective, or even sometimes as an expert, it's like, well, of course, we build tunnels. What's the big deal? But I think we'll, we'll find out in tonight's talk um, that it's, it's incredibly impressive what both is we aspire to do and what we will accomplish. And um, in, in introducing Matt, he, he graduated from our our program in 1992. I'm, I'm pretty sure he didn't have a class for me. We, we were trying to compare notes, and, and I don't think he did, because I usually remember names. But what's exciting for me is often as chair, I'm in a position where I need to talk to kids or freshmen who are trying to figure out, you know, what's civil environment and engineering about, what might be cool and exciting. And one of the things that I say is that in particular, our discipline is one where you can leave a mark on a city that is incredible in its impact, both in the short run and the long run. And so somebody who, relative to my age, has not been out of school that long, actually, is helping lead the project that is going to transform our waterfront in a way that, again, in the short run and the long run, will, will be incredible. I'm not making it up, basically, when I, uh, when I talk to, to kids and people trying to figure out what they might want to do or what is interesting and cool about civil environmental engineering. So there you have it, what is cool and interesting about civil environmental engineering infrastructure in general tonight is Matt Preeti. Hello. Thank you very much for coming here tonight to learn a little bit more about our little project that we have going down in uh, South Seattle. I'm personally very motivated to see the project completed and the viaduct come down because I've made a personal commitment to run every race that's held on that structure until it's gone. So <laughs> the sooner I get this tu tunnel done, the, the sooner I can quit doing that. So um, I've uh, boiled down about 15 years of project history into about an hour's presentation. Not easy. Um, but before I get to that story, I need to give you a little bit of context overall, because I think context is important. This is Seattle. It's beautiful. It's a great place to live. It's surrounded by hills, surrounded by mountains, surrounded by water. As a result of that, it's also a very challenging place to construct infrastructure. If we were out in the flats of Texas, it wouldn't be quite so hard. Here, very cha cha challenging. In fact, we only have two major north-south travel routes in the city, SR-99 and I-5. If either one of those is out of service, we get gridlock in town. So this is where uh, geography comes into, uh, into play. Seattle first started out down here in West Seattle about 1851. The folks there saw that, well, maybe they wanted to be a little more sheltered in the bay, get over onto the other side of Elliott Bay, not a lot of room to expand out there in West Seattle. So they moved over to uh, the shore of Elliott Bay around 1852 
expanded there. They determined that, wow, there's a lot of hills here. There's a lot of gullies. It's really still really hard to build stuff here. So, hence started Seattle's first mega pro project. It took from 1876 to 1931. And over the course of several different regrades, 15 million cubic yards of soil was removed from the hills in downtown Seattle. And it was deposited here in the Soto area, in the so Soto Flats south of King Street. By doing that, the city was able to expand its buildable footprint. And it began to prosper. And what comes with prosperity in an urban environment? Traffic congestion. Yes, in 1925, we had traffic congestion. Um, I just saw a study today that indicated that our national ranking, our yearly national ranking for traffic congestion, uh, hours of delay in traffic, um, we are number 10 in the nation. I'm not sure what we were in 1925, but from this photograph, it looks like we were probably pretty high. In fact, in 1931, there was a traffic study done in downtown, and there was a count of over 200,000 cars in 1931 entering and exiting downtown. That's a lot of cars for that time. Naturally, there was gridlock in downtown at that time, and people were clamoring for a bypass. Whenever you want to build a bypass, you have to have some place to put it. This was a natural place to put it. This is Alaskan Way in 1934. It's not the Alaskan Way that we know now. This Alaskan Way had fishing and commercial piers on one side, warehouses and commercial infrastructure on the opposite side. Not a lot of residents, not a lot of tourists, way different than it is now, and so that was the chosen site for building the first bypass in downtown, the Alaskan Way Viaduct. This structure was, began in 1951, completed over the course of four contracts, and finished in 1953. Right there. So this is the shot of op op opening day of the last contract. Um, we're still not quite sure who the two ladies are that are going for a walk on the bridge there. If any of you happen to know who they are, please let me know. So the viaduct served its purpose very well for a long, long time. Survived a couple of minor earthquakes. Survived a fairly ma major er earthquake. In 1985, the University of Washington had conducted a study on this structure and determined that it was seismically vulnerable. We started to uh, take a really serious look at this in 1999, put together a st study group, put together a project team to look at options for enhancing, repairing, or replacing the st structure. And more than two years into that effort, we had the Nisqually earthquake occur in 2001. And our studies have shown that if the Nisqually earthquake had progressed for another five seconds longer than it actually did, the viaduct would no longer be there. So it was that close to failure. So then, of course, we had to get very serious. And we came up with 85 different options on how to replace this. This is Seattle. We do like to debate options. It takes a long time to get through, through those. By 2007, we narrowed it down to two. A cut and cover replacement, where one side was the seawall, sea, sea and an elevated replacement that's built to modern day seismic and geometric standards. A structure like that ends up being 50% wider than what's there now, okay? So we put these to a public vote, and it was an advisory vote, and the public said, yeah, we don't like either one of those. You should go back to the drawing, draw, drawing board. We don't like either, e either one. We looked at why, and conclusions that we came to is they didn't understand why these were the best ones. And both of these options that we had would have closed the SR-99 corridor for a number of years while this, either one of these options was reconstructed. So we had to go back to the drawing board there. But before I can get to that story, I need to do the parallel story on the south end replacement. Just because the controversial piece in the central waterfront was at a, um, at a standstill, we determined that we could still replace the southern mile. We broke that off, had its own individual purpose and need, wrote an individual environmental document to clear it, 
and we proceeded with replacing the, the cellar mile because even if the central part failed in an, in an earthquake, when you have the southern part replaced, you can still get into and out, and out of town. This is a historical shot. This viaduct here in the southern mile no longer is there. It was very challenging replacing the southern mile. I already talked to you a little bit about the uh, fill that was put down into the Soto area. The green is fill. Yellow, brown, pink, and white there. That is all Duwamish River silt, almost 240 feet deep. The foundations for the new Holgate to King Bridge that we completed in 2011 are almost 280 feet deep, five foot diameter hollow tip steel driven piles. Very challenging thing to engineer, very challenging thing to construct. This is um, the way the Southern Mile replacement looked like halfway through. One of our major goals, we knew SR99 was very important, and so we had to find a way to keep it open during construction. 50% of engineering, I've found in my experience, is figuring out what to build. The other 50% is figuring out how are you going to do it. Ideas are great, but unless you have a way to execute them, they're just ideas. So this was our strategy. You can see the new southbound bridge built right next to the viaduct. And then once that was done, we demolished the viaduct in 2011. And then we built a new northbound bridge where the viaduct stood. We think public involvement is very import, important. At the end of the day, these are uh, public infrastructure pro projects. So we invited the public out on, on this day. We had over 3,000 people show up in the rain for a last walk on the viaduct. Um, how many people were, were there? Were, were folks that, I, I see some hands, yeah. So it was, it was a wet day, right? Okay. Um, this was the final stage of finishing the Southern Mile replacement. We followed through, kept the corridor open to traffic. Now I can get back to the main, the main story. At the time we were replacing the Southern Mile, we had a parallel effort trying to determine what's the replacement for the central waterfront portion of the viaduct. We had to come up with some principles and measure our options against those. First and foremost, this is a public safety job. If the viaduct was safe, we wouldn't have been doing a job. So public safety was num number one. We had to provide efficient movement of people and goods now and into the few, few future. Uh, maintain or improve the econ econ economies, enhance the waterfront downtown neighborhoods for people, solutions that are fiscally responsible, improve the health of the environment. That is a very tough road to hoe for one job. Um, the charge clearly was to not only provide transportation infrastructure, but to make the whole community better as a result. We spent the entire year of 2008 with a stakeholder advisory committee coming up with options. We came up with options, we vetted those options, we got feedback. At the end of that process, in the beginning of 2009, we had a board tunnel recommendation. The board tunnel recommendation is not just that, it's board tunnel plus some elements of transit involved, plus a rebuild of Alaskan Way. It's really a system, okay? And without the total system, each one of those components doesn't work optimally. So once the viaduct is down, the tunnel is done, there's still more work to do in the transit system and the rebuilding of Alaskan Way. So now let's get to the fun stuff. Um, Seattle has a lot of tunnels. Over 150 tunnels have been built in the last century in Seattle, starting back in 1890. We have the Sound Transit tunnels. We have the Mount Baker Ridge Tunnel, the Great Northern Railroad Tunnel, built in 1903. This is modern day tunneling 100 years ago. You can see their tools of choice, wheelbarrows, shovels, and picks. And you, uh, I, I especially like the safety gear they're wearing, which is basically none, and evidently you were even allowed, it. I think it was a requirement for everyone to smoke a pipe at that time too. <laughs> 
Digging this tunnel under downtown Seattle by hand resulted in a lot of ground settlement above. They didn't really have good means to control the ground, and as a result, they ended up uh, uh, damaging utilities, damaging buildings. I understand buildings had to be torn down. Um, we're not going to do that on, that on, on the, 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 this job. Um, but yeah, tun tunneling has, has greatly advanced since this time. Here's a shot of tunneling in 1930s. Now we've gotten rid of the picks and shovels, and we have pneumatic picks. And so you got a guy in there, and I'm not sure why there's two guys standing there watching the one guy work, but uh, you know. Um, but with this sort of, a of apparatus, you could mine fa faster, and the faster you can go, the better you can control the ground with this sort of mining technique. Now we get into the 1980s. This is the cross-section of the I-90 Mount Baker Ridge Tunnel, completed in the 80s right here in Seattle. It's not a well-known fact, but at that time of completion of this tunnel, this was the world's largest soft ground tunnel ever constructed. I believe it still is. And this was completed um, uh, via a, a uh, technique where they basically bored in these horizontal shafts around the outside, and then they dug the center out you, using mechanical equipment. So it wasn't done with a board tunneling machine like our board tunnel will be done with. By the time we get up into the 50s and 60s, tunneling has advanced to the point where we now have our first rudimentary tunnel boring machines, or TBMs. This is called an open-faced digger shield. And there's a guy back there that you can't, you can't see if this was actually operating. There would be a guy back there in a little control, con control cab. And he would be able to see the hoe, and he'd be able to reach out and dig out the ground in front of him while being protected within the steel shield that's keeping the ground from collapsing in. And then he has a little half-face shield above, above, above him, so if the, if the top of the tunneling uh, starts to cave, to cave in, he's protected from that, but the whole bottom side is, is open. The Third Avenue bus tunnel under, uh, under downtown was constructed with an open-face digger shield like this. They were able to do that for that tunnel because they were above the groundwater table. Very important di di distinction. Okay, so now we fast forward to today. If we didn't have this sort of boring, uh, of, of tunnel boring techno technology today, we would not be able to do the uh, tunnel that we are un undertaking now. This is a earth pressure balance machine. There are two different variations of this. One is called an EPB, one is called a slurry type. Both of them are designed specifically with what's called a semi-closed face and they're designed to pressurize the excavation chamber behind that face so they counteract the ground pressure in front so that you can't get collapses of excavation in an uncontrolled fashion, which would lead, of course, to subsidences or sinkholes. These machines are designed specifically to drastically minimize that risk. There are three um, world record Tunnel jobs shown here on the screen, the M30 in Spain, was completed in 2005, 50 feet. The Yangtze River Tunnel in China, 50 and a half feet, completed in 2009. And the current record holder for a soft ground board tunnel constructed 52 feet, completed in Sparvo, Italy, about two months ago. In fact, they completed about one week before we started our drive, and I received an email from their project man, 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 manager congratulating us on the start of ours and reminding us that he held the uh, record for at least one week. <laughs> so our tunnel boring contractor, we have a joint venture. It's called Seattle Tunnel Partners, and they are a joint venture of Dragados, who is uh, headquartered in Spain, and Tudor Prini, who is headquartered here in the United States. Dragados is the tunneling branch of the joint venture. And this is just a, a layout of the, um, of the tunneling experience that, they, that, that they, they have. Almost every one of the tunnels that are shown here on the screen were world record setting uh, tunnels at their time. So the contractor that we have here is no stranger 
to pushing the, en the envelope successfully. To do a job like this, it takes a worldwide e wide, wide e effort. The tunnel boring machine has been manufactured in Japan. The trailing gear behind the machine manufactured in China. The forms, the highly precise forms for the concrete liners manufactured in France. The main bearing, which is basically a big wheel bearing for th that, that allows the cutter head to turn, that was manufactured in Germany. The TBM tools on the front face, a lot of those were manufactured in Kent at the Robbins Cor Cor Corporation. And of course, our contractor, one of our main contractors is from Spain, the other one, uh, Tudor Perini from California. It takes a worldwide engineering effort uh, to be able to put together a machine that is able to complete a job like this successfully. So here is our tunnel. This is not complete, completed yet. It is under construction as we speak. This is 57 and a half feet in dia di diameter, quite a lot bigger than the 52 foot diameter bore that was completed in Sparbo. The reason ours is so large, we have to go back to slide number one. SR99 is only one of two north-south routes in Seattle. It's essential that this facility be able to handle full height legal freight loads. There are other tunnels that have been constructed in the world that are double deck like this. Some of them even have three lanes on each deck, but you cannot drive anything through them larger than a minivan because of the vertical clearance. When you increase the vertical clearance, it, limit, it limits the uh, number of lanes you can have. This tunnel has ventilation plenum on the right side. It has electrical rooms on the left side. It has utility corridors in the, in, the, in, the, in, the invert. And it has a six foot, sa or a, pardon me, an eight foot safety shoulder on one side of each deck. That's very important, of course, because if folks need to pull out of traffic because their car is disabled, they have a safe place to do so. It also provides an access for tow trucks or any other assistance vehicles to make it in to folks that may need assistance. There's also emergency egress passages every 600 feet so that folks can uh, go in there and there's a phone and they can call for help if, if they need help. Uh, this is a single point extraction ventilation system. In this tunnel, there are vent buildings on both ends and depending upon the carbon monoxide readings in the tunnel, at any point in time, they can strategically open certain vents, close, up, clo clo close others, to make sure that the air quality in the tunnel is good at all times. This tunnel is approximately two miles long. It goes underneath the downtown Seattle. We already talked about um, the, so the, the Soto area, where uh, all the fill is. That is where the launch pit for the board tunnel ma machine is now. It's going to start there. It has started there. You go traverse underneath of Alaskan Way, cross under the viaduct at Yesler Way, go kind of catty quarter underneath the downtown, take a big sweeping turn and come up um, under 6th Avenue, a uh, couple blocks north of the Pink Elephant Car Wash. Most folks know where that is. So let's talk about uh, construction on, on this job. As you can see here, the detour strategy that we put in place to keep SR99 open during construction played out very well for constructing the board tunnel. We had a transition zone constructed. You can see SR99 going around it. And that way, whatever our central waterfront solution was, we would have a way to build the connection or the launching of that next phase. So since we're building a board tun tunnel, this is where we're building the launch pit. You can see our tunnel boring machine down in that pit, ready to go. But first we had to build that pit. And this is not very good ground down in this area, as we all, as we all, we all know. In order to open up a hole large enough to launch the tunnel boring machine out of, we had to drill in 274 interlaced secant piles. These are five foot diameter, cast in place, concrete piles, reinforced and they go down about 100 feet plus, and they form a relatively watertight box, 
80 feet wide, 80 feet deep, 400 feet long. We dewatered that box, excavated, excavated it out, and we constructed our launch pit. This was a very challenging hole to uh, build. Several hundred thousand cubic uh, yards of not very good soil came out of that hole. Um, and the, the water table is only about nine feet down, so the dewatering effort uh, is actually still on, on, ongoing here. The slab that we've had to pour in the bottom of this hole, um, once we uh, got it down to degrade uh, to uh, launch the tunnel boring machine out, machine out of, there's a 13 foot thick reinforced concrete slab in the invert of that hole to resist the water pressure from boil, boil, boiling up. Now let's talk about Bertha. This is Bertha, weighing in, a, in, in at a proud 6,800 tons, 57 and a half foot diameter, 326 feet long, in told. Um, Common question, why is she called Bertha? It's because we had a contest. It's very common to have a, con a con 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 contest. We like to involve the pu public. We especially like to involve school children and educational opportunities, so we held a public con con contest. We opened it up to school children in Washington State. They were able to submit their names, and then a panel of esteemed ju ju judges uh, got to um, choose from those names. They also had to write 100 words describing why their name was the best. There were actually two different groups that proposed the name Bertha, and it was for the same reason. It's named after Bertha Knight Landis, who was the first female mayor in any metropolitan area in the nation. She was mayor of Seattle from 1926 to 1928. And the real selling point on that name was she was elected on a platform of I'm going to clean this town up. So when you think what Bertha's gonna do for the city overall, allowing the whole waterfront redevelopment and the new front porch for the city, the name seemed right. We knew, of course, that would, uh, uh, people would think, well, you, you named her Bertha just because she's big. That's not true. She is big, but she is named after Bertha Knight Landis. So let's talk about how an earth pressure balance machine works. This is a cross section, the blue is the cutter head. That's the part that rotates. It is driven by 28 different electrical variable frequency drive motors, combining for, a 20, for about 25,000 horsepower. It works basically like a big rotary cheese grater. As the machine is pushing forward into the soil, the cutter head goes around and around and has 240 cutting bits on the front. It shaves off dirt. It goes through the holes in the cutter head into the excavation chamber behind it. Kind of the light green piece there, and that's a pressure bulkhead. Everything in front of that sees the full hydrostatic pressure of the ground in front. During the course of this drive, there's going to be up to five to six bar of hydrostatic water pressure and ground pressure in front. That bulkhead is what keeps that water pressure from flooding back into the machine where we're trying to build the rings for the tunnel. So how do you get the earth out, the tun tun tunnel muck is what we, 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 we call, call, call it. How do you get that out from a six bar pressure envi environment ba basically to an atmospheric envi environment? The trick is that orange tube. That is a screw conveyor. It's basically an Ar Archimedes screw designed to lift the fluidized tunnel muck up out of the excavation chamber. And as it travels along the length of that, of that screw, it dissipates the pressure in the fluid through friction loss. Friction loss generates heat, and it generates noise. You stand there next to that thing when it's, uh, it's operating, gets up to about 140 de degrees, and it's extremely loud. Uh, that's how you know it's, it's working. If it works correctly, by the time the muck has made it out to the end of that screw conveyor and drops out onto the flat belt, if it's just dropping off in a nice, leisurely fashion, you've got, got it right. If it's kind of blowing out the end, you need to dissipate a little more pressure. 
and then you got to get a bunch of guys with shovels and buckets to clean up your mess. Um, so they've been practicing with this for the first 430 feet of the, of the drive, and they have this part of it dialed in. Now I'm going to go through a, just a very short video of how this tunnel boring machine looks in operation. I think this is supposed to start all by itself. We'll see. And it does. So there's a cross section of the machine. You can see the flat belt can, uh, with the arrow. The cutter head goes around and around, shaves off all the dirt, goes into the pressurized chamber, up that screw conveyor, dissipating the pressure, drops off onto the flat belt at atmospheric. Easy, easy. It's being pushed forward off of these concrete rings. These concrete rings form the liner for the tunnel. And I'll talk a little bit more about those. But that is what the machine pushes off of. There are 56 hydraulic thrust jacks, some of which you can see there. They're pushing off of those concrete rings to push the machine forward into the, the uh, ground. 44,000 tons of thrust force. It's a lot. And there are 10 of these pieces that make a concrete ring, six and a half feet long. The way this works is they retract back a few of those uh, thrust jacks, just enough so they can put in that next piece, push back against those. Once they get all 10 of those in, including the keystone, which you see here, they can then start the machine forward again, pushing forward for another six and a half foot drive. Once they go forward another six and a half feet, they have to stop, build a new ring, and then pu push off that. And these are all bolted together, together Ga gas gasketed so that the uh, tunnel remains watertight. Constructing Bertha was fun. This is a shot of the uh, machine being built over in a dry dock over in Osaka, Japan at Hitachi Zosin's plant. You can see some of the thrust jacks, those, those, bl those black little circles around the peri perimeter. Those are some of the 56 thrust jacks that push the machine for forward. It cost about $80 million to build this. Delivered. Took about one year to build, six months to design, six months to test and ship. It's about a two-year effort from design to actually showing up on site, ready to mine. Another uh, visual of uh, folks working on the machine assembly at the plant. You can see the scale of some of the uh, lifting ca ca cables there, about as big, big around as one of the guys. To manipulate pieces around that were this large, up to 900 tons each, they utilized a 3,600 ton capacity floating double barge crane sitting out in the bay. Uh, we don't have any cranes of this size in the United States, very few of these in the world, um, but that is what they used in order to assemble the machine. Once the machine was assembled, it had to get here, or did, it, 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 it had to be disassembled, then put on a boat. Very few boats that were able to do this. Uh, this is the Jumbo Fair Partner uh, coming into Elliott Bay, on the right-hand shot. This is a uh, ship with two 900-ton capacity cranes. It is able to load and unload itself. So once it docked here at the apron of Terminal 46, over the course of the next few days, it unloaded itself with a little bit of help from its friends. <laughs> That's the cutter head there, uh, weighing in about 800 tons. The largest pieces of Bertha, 41 pieces on that ship, the largest ones weighed almost 900 tons. And we had to find a way, of course, to get those pieces of the machine over to the job site. It wasn't a long haul, only about a quarter mile. Um, but you know, there's a lot of in, in, infrastructure, you, utilities, pavement. You don't really want to damage that stuff. So they had to find a way to distribute the weight. They did that with what we call Goldhofer Modular Moving Systems. You can see them there, they're the red pieces. 
That particular arrangement there is the heaviest arrangement that we had, 96 axles, 768 tires. By having that many tires, we were able to distribute the load so that the pressure of each tire on the ground was no more than a legally loaded semi-truck. So of course, once we got, it, we got it there and got the ship unloaded, some assembly was required. <laughs> we did not find any extra parts. That's, that's good. It comes with batteries? <laughs> uh, comes with a 26,000 kilovolt extension cord. <laughs> the assembly pro 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 process um, was undertaken uh, 24 hours a day, seven day, days a week. Once it was assembled in the pit, there's a shot of the cutting head going in. It took another two months to retest. It's a very complex piece of machine, machinery. It was tested in the, in the dry dock over in Japan. It was tested again after reassembly here. This is a great shot of the cutting head, probably one of the best ones that we have. You can see that about 30% of it is open space. And so that is where the soil goes through. You can see the red bits, the yellow bits, the black bits, those are ripper teeth, uh, drag bits, disc cutters, a variety of tools on the front to go through the different types of soil. So once we got the machine assembled and in the pit, it was time to have our inauguration which is a uh, appropriate term because we have two uh, governors here on the uh, screen, one for former Governor Gregoire and current Governor Inslee. They joined us for dedicating the machine before we started our mining. They also had about 5,000 of our closest friends because once again, uh, we like to involve the public in, it, in our jobs, give them a chance to see what they're uh, getting. So we invited the public down for our, um, our dedication cer ceremony, and I believe that uh, the people that signed in, we had over 4,000 people that s signed in, and we estimated there's probably at least 1,000 that just came in anyway. Um, but clearly, it was a very popular event, um, one of the very few events where we had kids, in, kid, kid, kids allowed on the jo job site. I, I assume some people were there, maybe some people. I, I, I was there. I see it. I, I see it. I see two. Okay. That yeah, was a good day. They even had food trucks. It was fun. <laughs> okay. So now the machine is built. It's tested. Now it's time to, to, to operate it. This is one of our uh, Spanish uh, contractors here. Um, these, are the, these are the guys that are actually operating this rig. This is a shot of the control room where they can see what's going on the machine at any point in time. It measures the pressure in front of the machine. It measures the pressure in the cutting head chamber. It measures the pressure in the screw conveyor. It measures a variety of things, over a thousand data points coming into the data collection center every second that this machine is operating. I believe they have like a 24 gigabyte hard drive they archive each day to collect all, collect all, all, all of that stuff. So once we, the mining starts, the tunnel boring machine not only does the mining, it erects the liner. The liner was what keeps it being a tunnel. That's very important. So the soft ground tunnel have a, way to keep a, have, have a way to keep the dirt and the water out. The tunnel liner is two feet thick. It's made up of 10 se segments per ring. Uh, the segments are six and a half feet wide. They are 7,000 PSI, 1% reinforcing, okay? Tightly gasketed and bolted together. Designed to withstand a 2,500 year recurrence earthquake, which is about a 9.0 on uh, various uh, measures. These are also designed to go, ar uh, go around curves. If, if you recall from my previous slides, this tunnel is not straight. So when I say these tunnel liners are six and a half feet wide, that's average. One side of this ring, of each six and a half foot piece, if you were to just take one ring all by itself, the keystone is three inches narrower than six and a half feet. 
The piece on the opposite side is three inches wider than six and a, and a half feet. So depending upon how you construct that ring and orient it in your circle, you're turning the liner around a curve. The machine is capable of mining around a two degree curve. And if we do everything right, we're assembling the liner along the same geometry so it follows that same ge geometry. This is a shot of the, fa of the uh, segment fabrication plant. It is down in Fredrickson, which is near Puyallup. The molds and the assembly system down here were manufactured in France. The tolerance on the mold is one millimeter in any dimension. Those are checked every day. The production molds are checked against a master mold once a week. It's very important that the tolerances be maintained for water tightness and qual qual quality because at the end of the day, um, you want a nice uh, watertight, safe tunnel. Um, get my pointer back here. So this is what the segment casting yard looks like. Uh, clearly a lot of pieces of con concrete 1,400 rings times 10 pieces per ring is 14,400 pieces of concrete that are individually cast, trucked up here to the, jo the job site, put together in the exact right place in the tunnel at the exact right time. How do you do that? You do it carefully. <laughs> this is a shot of the tunnel boring machine segment erector. You can see that that red piece, that red shoe, it's curved. It's curved at the same radius and degree of curvature as the inside surface of the tunnel liner ring. So that shoe goes down against the inside surface of that ring and it picks it up. It picks it up through suction only. Through suction only it takes that 18 ton piece of concrete picks it up, keeps the suction on, puts it up into the correct position, puts it into place where guys with big bolts bolt it to the next piece, put the thrust rams back against that new piece, they go and get the next one, put it in. In order to pass the test on a, a startup for the segment erector, it had to pick up one of those 18 ton pieces of concrete, turn the power off, and have it not lose suction for 40 minutes. It's a very critical test. If you drop one, that's not, that's not good. So the seals are checked often. So once we're about 1,500 feet into the tun tunnel drive, we start building the interior structures behind the tunnel machine while it is still mining. Normally, you would not do that. It makes things complicated. The logistics of trying to continue your mining operation while you're building your double deck concrete structure behind you are complex. But the schedule we set for the contract um, was intentionally set so they would have to do, to do, to do this. The viaduct is living on uh, borrowed time and we would prefer to have our tunnel completed while the viaduct is still standing on its own. So we set up the, the schedule realistically so that the contractor could do this. It's hard, it's logistically challenging, but they do have a good method on constructing this double-decker bridge behind the tunneling operation as both are uh, uh, undergoing. Tunneling operation is supported through supply train in the invert, Supply train for uh, casting all the uh, bridge structure is on the upper deck. The lower deck goes in last, cast in place, or pardon me, precast concrete slabs for expe expediency, because that's the last piece of the bridge to go in. This is the last look at Bertha as she left the launch pit. We are about 430 feet into the drive. Actually, this morning, I think we're, I think we're probably about 480 feet in. Um, so that's updated da daily, of course. The big steel struts that you see there, that's the reaction frame. You remember that the machine 
pushes off the concrete rings to drive itself forwards. When it first starts, there's nothing to push off of. So that big steel reaction frame is what it pu pushes off of. It resists the force and it allows it to drive forward into the ground. That reaction frame has to stay there for a thousand feet of tunneling because eventually you build up enough friction around your concrete rings and the surrounding ground that you can push with full force against those and you don't run the risk of pushing all of the tunnel rings back out of the hole. <laughs> that would be a little bit of a setback. The other logistical issue here is this tunnel boring machine is going forwards and it's a two mile long drive. The conveyor belt assembly, the 26 kilovolt power cord, all the water feeds, the slurry lines, the bentonite lines, everything that supports this thing has to be continually extended as the machine goes forwards. So all the support utilities end up being two miles long by the time the drive is completed. This is a look at the ground profile that we're going to be uh, tunneling through. The yellow is fill. We, talk, we talked about that. The common misconception that this tunnel is in fill and why are we building a tunnel in fill? It's bad soil. The truth of the matter is the very start of the tunnel is in fill. Once we get two blocks in, we're entirely down in the glacially over-consolidated tills and sands. Very good material for mining very good material for having a long-lasting, durable tunnel in. Blue is clay, orange is sand, per light purple, green are till and till-like materials. Very hard. I don't know how many people have tried to go in their, back, their backyard and plant their new tree. You get down more than a couple of feet, the, drill, the digging is very tough. We call this stuff hard pan. It's, uh, it is, it, 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 it's not rock. It is very difficult to dig through in a very strong soil matrix. So it was important that um, as we were developing the design for the project, we understood what we had to tunnel underneath. This is a three-dimensional model that can be cut and rendered any direction that shows what is underneath of the ground as we go forwards tunnel boring uh, liners in, in green. You can see right there, those are utilities in King Street. Those are 100-year-old, uh, uh, four to six foot diameter storm sewers, pile supported, because remember this ground is no good in this, in this area. So we go underneath, uh, uh, under those. And then you see the foundations off on the right-hand side. Those are the viaduct foundations. We're not under the viaduct, but we're very close to it. We also see a variety of utilities in Alaskan Way. We have to protect those. There's monitoring uh, points on all utilities to make sure that we are not affecting them. And then as we go further north up to around Yesler Way, you can see the structure over on the left. That is the start of the Elliott Bay seawall. There's a common misconception that there's there's a conflict between doing a bored tunnel in this area and the sea, the sea wall is demonstrated here. They're not even close. One of our more challenging parts of the drive is going to be right here as we go underneath of the Alaska Way Viaduct Foundations at Yesler Way. And then we have rendered this all the way up through downtown. This little piece here, um, these, this building here with the brown piles, that's the uh, historic federal building. Um, the challenge to try to get an easement from the, the uh, feds. We, 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 we got it though. There's over 200 properties that we have to monitor during the course of, of this drive. When we first start up, it's especially challenging. I mentioned already the first couple blocks of this drive, part, of the, part of, the, of the diameter of the machine is in fill soil. The fill soil is the yellow stuff, okay? Not very good stuff. That's the stuff that was basically blasted down into the bay with fire ho ho hoses, um, so very loose. So for the first block of our drive, we have protection walls on both sides. Those are seek and pile walls similar to what lined the launch pit. Those protect infrastructure of the, the Port of Seattle on the left side. They protect the viaduct foundations on the right side. Over the top of that, 
is jet grout improved ground. Over the top of that is a five foot thick reinforced concrete slab. That five foot thick reinforced concrete slab is there for a very good reason. It keeps the tunnel being a tunnel for this first part of the drive. I don't know how many folks have been in the pool. You got a beach ball. You try to hold the beach ball down. You let go, pop, pop, pops up, right? That's through buoyancy force. We have a 57 and a half foot diameter air void, which is a tunnel. We only have, at this point, about 20 feet of soil above us, and the water table's nine feet down. If we didn't have some sort of way to react against that buoyancy force, this tunnel would pop right up out of the ground, just like the beach ball. So the way it resists that is that force is resisted by the tunnel pushing up against the jet grout improved ground, which is resisted by the five foot thick reinforced concrete slab, which is tied into those secant pile walls, which at this point act as tension piles that are anchored down in the good hard glacial tilt. Tunnel is not going anywhere. So for that's, that's where it is for the first block. Once we get north to King Street, our buoyancy slab is gone. We're down deep enough, we don't need it. There's enough dead weight above the tunnel, it'll keep, keep, keep it down. But we're still alongside the viaduct for a long ways. So we have, we continue our cutoff pile, pile wall, our secant pile wall, protecting the foundations of the viaduct from the tunnel drive. We already know the tunnel or, or the viaduct foundations are very susceptible to disturbance. One of our main goals, keep the viaduct open during construction. It'd be pretty embarrassing for all of us if our tunneling were to damage the foundations and we were not able to keep the structure open. The dollar amount of that uh, tunneling in a box area, um, contractors spend about $50 million do 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 dollars, um, constructing everything that you see on the screen designed specifically to uh, provide a nice, safe, tunneling envi environment during startup and to make sure the viaduct stays up. Here is a, uh, what it's gonna look like as we tunnel under the, vi the viaduct near Yesler Way. We're gonna be doing this probably uh, beginning of next year, January, February timeframe. We have reinforced the structure at this point. We've reinforced it with up to seven plies of um, a basically glued on fiberglass wrap. It's an exoskeleton. We've also installed cutoff piles underneath the foundations. And we have supplemental compaction grouting tubes installed for uh, supplemental grouting as we go underneath. And that's what it looks like underground as Bertha makes her way under the foundations in between the uh, micro pile walls that we have installed. And yes, we can actually hit the, bull, the, the bullseye. The, the, uh, the tolerance on the tunnel alignment that the contractor must meet is six inches plus or minus in any given direction. They are meeting that right now. This tunnel machine, as I'm told, I haven't actually steered it myself, but I'm told by the, op the operators that it steers like a dream. So as we go underneath the downtown, once you get beyond Yesler Way, we have over 200 buildings that we need to monitor. We do that through a variety of, of means. We have basically an interlaced uh, automatic total station loop. Each one of these machines can see the next machine. And they not only survey each other for control, but they're surveying dedicated points on buildings. And they're also creating a three-dimensional surface of the building and the roadway surface. So at any point in time, we can see if anything is changing. That's our last line of defense, though. Our first line of defense is good tunnel boring machine, op machine operation, operated by people who have done world record setting bores like this before with technology such as this. We, we have that. We also have um, over a thousand mo monitoring points uh, installed through downtown. Many of them are tilt meters and inclinometers and extensometers that are installed down deep in the ground and, and, and extend to a mere few feet above the tunnel crown. So if you start to get a ground movement issue 200 feet down, you can pick it up way down there. 
and the machine has a variety of means to inject bentonite or grout or a variety of other two-part epoxy things to um, backfill any ground loss issues that you may have occurring well in advance of them making its way up to where you'd see any movement on structures. This whole system that you see here is really just a last check fail safe. It's not the main means of control. Here's a shot of the, um, of the uh, buildings that are in our settlement monitoring zone. Yes, we have uh, agreements and monitoring points and easements with all these folks. After about 12 to 14 months of tunneling, we come up in the north end. This is a shot of our tunnel receiving pit. Very big hole, similar to the hole that we dug on the north or, or on the south end. The difference is we're above the water ta table here, so it was a much easier hole to dig. This will also form, of course, the um, north portal for the tunnel once we're all done. And yes, of course, in 12 to 14 months, we will have another public event as the tunnel boring machine breaks its way through the wall of the, the, this pit. And I hope to see most of you there. This is what it looks like when it's all, it's all done. This is the north portal looking to the south. Full four-dimensional, or four, full four-ramp interchange in the north end, north and southbound offs, north and southbound ons, okay? In the south end, we have the same, the same thing. We have north and southbound offs and north and southbound ons. There are no midtown ramps, and I know that's been a controversy, especially for folks like myself who live in West Seattle. We're gonna miss our midtown ramps. Uh, but we gotta think, what is the purpose of the viaduct originally? It's to bypass downtown. The main feature of the viaduct that allows that to happen is the Battery Street Tunnel, which is two lanes e e each way. If you want the board tunnel to be the bypass for downtown, it only needs to be two lanes each way. That's what we have now. But the system's not complete. You still have to get people into and out of downtown, and you have to get people up to the Elliott and Western area to access the northwest part of Seattle. That's where the total system comes into play, that once the viaduct is down, you've got to improve Alaskan Way and create another manifold, including transit access, to be sure that everybody is served and the system really functions no, um, uh, no, no less than uh, the system that we have now with one important ex exception, it's not gonna fall down in, it, in an earthquake. Our schedule is here. Um, our tunnel project is slated to be done by the end of 2015, open to traffic by the beginning of 2016, after which we uh, tear down the viaduct as fast as we can. And then we build the new Alaskan Way in its footprint. And by the time we get to 2017, 2018, I need a new job. Um, this, this is a, gr a great shot. Um, this is about taken about two weeks back. It's just looking back from the trailing gantry of Bertha. You can see a couple of our uh, highly skilled employees going to, 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 to work. Probably a fun commute, especially when they have to do that two miles in. <laughs> and of course, we've got to remind ourselves, what are we getting in the end? Um, the viaduct will be gone. Uh, the central waterfront area will redevelop. The Alaskan Way will be built where the viaduct was. And where Alaskan Way now is will be redeveloped to an 80-foot wide public space. Brand new front yard for the city. We have a project information center in Pioneer Square. It's located at 211 First Avenue South. It has a scale model of Bertha. It cut her head turns and lights go on and it's great for kids. It goes through some of the stuff that I talked about here now. It talks a little bit about um, how we changed geog geography in Seattle to suit our needs because it's a very challenging place to build. It talks about moving people and goods and it talks about, of course, the next iteration of uh, how we are changing things in Seattle, which of course is the SR99 board tunnel. So if folks have a chance to come down here and visit this, it is free. And uh, we've been told that uh, it's very, uh, it's very in informational, and we're we're pretty proud of, proud of it. <laughs>